Tonight, I'm excited to welcome the award-winning journalist, Allison Stewart, host of WNYC's All of It, to discuss junk, digging through America's love affair with stuff. Allison has reported for NPR, NBC News, ABC News, and CBS News, and before WNYC covered politics for MTV News and hosted for PBS. Junk is the result of a three-year odyssey spurred by her excavation of her late parents' basement into yard sales, antique roadshow, pawn stars, and the collective madness that spurs us to store everything big and small that comes our way. Please join me in welcoming Allison and Junk to Strand. First of all, you guys are stars for coming out in this horrible weather. I thought it was going to be me and Severe and my friend Scooter just sitting here having, having drinks. So I really appreciate it. And this is the only book event I'm doing for the paperback. So, and it's kind of like a bucket list moment for me to be at the Strand. All right, I'm going to put 20 minutes on a clock. I usually have a big clock behind, in front of me at the studio so I don't talk too long. Um, so this book started after I was having lunch with my literary agent. And she, you know, you ever finish a big project and somebody goes, so what are you gonna do next? And you're like, God, I just finished what I, this huge thing. I had just written this other book that was about the history of African American education. And I thought it was the only book that I had in me. I was convinced that was it, this is all I ever wanted to write. And I kind of tried to figure out an excuse to tell her. And I said, well, you know, I, you know, my parents passed away, and I really have to clean out the basement of their house. It's something that's got to get done. we got to sell the house. Uh, it's kind of a project. And saying that it was a project is the understatement of the century. My sophisticated, elegant, educated parents, they lived in a gorgeous house in Princeton, New Jersey, had a basement that was just full of junk. It wasn't really their fault. They were born in 1929. They went to segregated schools. They came of age during World War II when the popular slogan was, use it up, wear it out, make do. If a person grew up in that era, if you got a paper bag, you kept that paper bag. And trust me, my parents kept every paper bag. And I have to admit, a lot of the stuff in the basement was mine and was my sister's. There was this dollhouse that she was saving for the girls but the girls were, one was in law school and one was getting her MFA, so it was our fault too. And the problem was the junk was intertwined with all these memories and I really wasn't sure how to untangle that to get through it all. So I kind of went into, anybody knows me, I'm kind of a sunny person, glasses half full, so I went into it with glasses half full mode and uh, I'm gonna read to you a little bit about how, what happened the first couple days we tried to clean out the basement. Okay. Day one, game face on. I'd psych myself up. I was, this was gonna be a long slog. I would eat the previously mentioned elephant one bite at a time, the elephant being the basement. I flicked on the light switch just inside the door. I walked down the curved stairwell, arrived at the final landing, looked around and ran back up. My second approach was more successful. I'd created a new paradigm. This was my job. I was an executor of an estate, being paid to deal with all matters. If I had a time frame to get this done, so I better get going. First, I needed tools and backup. I went to one of those giant home improvement barns and walked the aisles looking for supplies. I wasn't really sure what I would need, so I just went with my gut. I bought bags, all kinds of bags, Ziploc, contractor, recycling, rope, labels, storage bins, more bags, duct tape, plastic gloves, flashlights. I was surprised I wasn't stopped and questioned at checkout about my motives, given my shopping cart looked like a punch list for a first-time abductor. So I got my friends involved. My sister lived out of town, my friend Sylvia. We decided we would do this on weekends. All three of us were there at the first session. Our spirits were good for the first eight hours. There were some big laughs. I found my mother's charge card for the now defunct Bamberger's department store, only it didn't say credit card, it said homemaker's card. Try that in 2015. There were Franks and Lira. There was a Life magazine from the year I was born. In one day, we filled 10 bags full of giveaways and another 10 full of trash, made a few piles that weren't quite identifiable yet. We were full of warm fuzzies by the end of the day, some tears, a few oh wow moments. We walked back up the stairs satisfied. We went out to dinner, had some wine. The next morning, we returned. We flicked on the lights, walked down the stairs energetically, and stopped cold. The place looked the same. The same. Was this a cruel joke? Had someone put everything back that we'd removed? We were, st were we starring in the sequel of the movie Groundhog Day? We'd imagined this dramatic before and after reveal, but it was still a before and before scene. How was it possible? 
Though at first glance it appeared we'd not made a dent, we had a teeny tiny little dent, a ping really. It was then I realized I was in the first stage of the Kubler-Ross dab de grief model. I was in the big D, denial. Somehow I decided this project wasn't so bad, it wouldn't take so long to, you know, tidy up. Given what was in front of me, stage one was over almost as soon as it began. It didn't take long to move right through to A. Anger. Why was there all this stuff? What the hell were we going to do with it? Why'd they have to die anyway? How are we going to do this? My sister expressed it best when she pulled out an enormous bag of used Christmas bows and shouted, Really, mother? Really? <laughs> but for my mom, a child of the Great Depression, a shiny Christmas bow was an enormous luxury and not something to toss away, so she didn't. The bows made sense to me. However, the cheap water glass from my prom stamped GRHS, Glen Ridge High School, We've Got Tonight, May 27, 1983. That made no sense to me. And the theme was the name of a Bob Seger soft rock song. And as an adult, I realized wholly inappropriate for teenagers. <laughs> my anger quickly subsided when I realized so much of this junk was the history of our family. We found my sister's report cards from fifth grade. In 1966, she was a very good student and was, quote, learning to become gracious about winning. <laughs> Both are still true. I found boxes and boxes of VHS tapes my parents had recorded of my newscasts. We found an autographed book of poetry by Langston Hughes my mother received when she was a teenager. We found a button from the 1963 March on Washington when Dr. King gave his I Had a Dream speech. We recovered a letter my grandfather wrote to our great-grandfather asking for my grandmother's hand in marriage. All this junk was the unfortunate byproduct of a lot of love. The anger melted into the next stage, bargaining. We started a set of boxes called Family Hole to put in the storage unit. Family homes raised for everything from clothing to dishware, anything that brought up emotional ties to the family. But there was one rule about family hold to, to ensure things ran smoothly and relatively tear-free. Do not look at pictures. Pictures could derail a whole day. As long as the photos were avoided and put somewhere safe, we could forge ahead. And we did. Days turned into weeks and turned into months. No amount of bargaining was going to get this job done. And that was the second D hit in depression. Cleaning out the basement felt like a Sisyphean task. When we walked into the house for the umpteenth time, I realized the leaves had begun to fall. We'd been at this for so long that our shorts and t-shirts had been replaced by sweaters and down vests. We were in a whole new weather pattern, and the basement was still the basement. Acceptance, that final A arrived around the same time of that first blast of cold, crisp air. I knew it in my bones. This task was beyond me, my friend Sylvia, my sister, or any configuration of us. We needed professional help. And by professional help, I mean an organization called College Hunks Hauling Junk. I saw their truck when I went to get all those bags and stuff, and I wrote down the number, and I just called them up. I, didn't, I had never heard of a really dealt with a junk removal company, and the first thing they say to you when you call is, how may we help you have a stress-free day? How telling is that, that that is what they think about that, think about that in life. And that call changed my life because I knew as soon as I started talking to the junk removal guy, I knew what my next book was going to be. So it was interesting because a lot of people, whenever I told them what I was doing, everybody had a story. Everybody had a story from the, my friend who's a fancy pants attorney to the nice lady who paints my fingernails. You know President Obama has stuff somewhere, one drawer. You know Joe Biden has it. He definitely has junk. We all have junk. My favorite tale was the woman who told me that her mother had a box that was labeled pieces of string too short to tie things with. And that's what was inside. <laughs> so right now I'm guessing some of you have gone someplace in your head <laughs> where you have your junk. So the subtitle of the book referred to love affair, because I thought when we were kind of figuring out what that should be, you know, some love affairs are productive and pleasurable, and some of them are really not that good for us. So I wanted to explore the attitudes and the behaviors, what was going on in our culture. Why were we collecting things? Why were we fetishizing things? Why were we monetizing junk? So I spent these two or three years really trying to get to the root of it all. Now, I'm not talking about hoarders, because hoarding is a serious mental disorder, it's in the DSM, and I actually don't use that as a, a term anymore, like, oh, he's such a hoarder. It's so serious, it can be life-threatening, um, it affects about 2-5% to of the population that we know of. I'm, and I'm not talking about the other end of the spectrum, which are collectors, and collectors are specifically people who buy and sell according to mission, and this is what the psychologists say, quote, make rational choices and display items appropriately. I'm talking about the rest of us in between, whose closet is a hot mess, or whose garage you can only fit one car in if you have a garage. So, you know, 
one group that is particularly vulnerable is a group with ADD, ADHD, anybody who has problems with executive fun functioning, and they call those people who are chronically disorganized. And here's the difference. This uh, psychologist told me, if you had a hoarder and somebody's chronically disorganized and you sent elves in to clean both their houses, the hoarder would be horrified the next day, be upset, crying, it would be in distress and would fill that house back up. The chronically disorganized person would be like, yes, thank you, show me how to do that. And it was interesting to learn along the way, talking to psychologists, that some of us are just more cognit cognitively vulnerable to this. You know, there's this issue of Human beings don't have internal ability to assess value. Dan Ariely, I don't know if you, who he is, you know who he is, he does a lot of work with Duke University, and I'm paraphrasing what he told me, is that we don't have internal value meters to tell us how much things are worth, rather we focus on the relative advantage of one thing over another and estimate the value accordingly. We take our cues from things outside, external things, the Kelly Blue Book, and then sometimes your internal processing gets involved, I love my car, the Blue Book tells me it's worth this much, and that can lead to really off-base evaluations. Um, an amazing example recently was on Antiques Roadshow. A man brought a sculpture in for $300. He said he bought it you know, at a yard sale. They assessed it for thirty dollars to $50,000. They said it was an amazing piece of primitive art. So um, the show aired, and then some lady called them and said, I'm sorry, that's my high school project. <laughs> that's not a piece of primitive art. Uh, but the thing is, the man wasn't upset. He told a local reporter, I hated it when it was thirty to $50,000, because who wants thirty to $50,000 lying around your house? He now just keeps the jug on his coffee table, and he's really happy about it. So the question is, what is the actual value of this jug? Um, I went to Antiques Roadshow. As you probably all know, junk is big business in television. At last count, there had been 28 television shows about junk, Pawn Star, Storage Wars, you got the whole thing. Um, Antiques Roadshow came to New York City and I was able to get a, a tour backstage. They had a minder on me the whole time. Um, they were very, there are certain things they told me I couldn't write about, but uh, I wanna give you an example of what kind of things happen when Pink Bull bring their stuff. So they enter an area, and it's called triage. People present their objects, and then they are assigned to one of 24 different categories of appraisal. The groups include glass, silver, sports, decorative arts, jewelry, dolls, folk art. The person is then given a ticket to a table, and off they go to meet one of the approximately 70 appraisers on the site. My minder, my host, said, no one gets turned away. It's kind of like an ER. They determine the appraisal lines and where you should go. So approaching the triage table is an auburn-haired woman of a certain age wearing a long, flowing floral tunic and a lot of costume jewelry. She's a bit panicked about what item to present. Ticket holders are allowing her to bring two things. So she turns to two fellows behind her and she says, does this look like an obvious piece of garbage? She says, pointing to a beat-up painting of a street scene. She also has a piece of jewelry in a vase. Well, you can always take the jewelry to get that appraised, offers the taller of the two guys. You're right, thank you. The triage specialist hands her two tickets and she wants to confirm that she goes to two different tables. She turns to the man behind her, thank you for your patience and your help. She later finds out the painting is worthless, but it doesn't matter to her. She says she just loves it. Next up at triage is a big man with a small dog brush. Not a brush for a little dog, but a clothing brush with a perfect ceramic canine figurine on top. It's in pristine shape, and the puppy sculpture was really fine. He spied it at a second-hand store and stalked it for a while. He said, I saw it in the window. I bought it for $5. I've only seen one more like it online. It's just fantastic. And he off he goes to collectibles. Next up was a very curious group. It was a family, six people together, and they were very, very secretive. Everything was wrapped tightly. They were eyeing everyone around them, especially me with my recorder and my notepad. They leaned down to whisper to the assessor and to start to unwrap what they have, all while giving me the hairy eyeball. Their behavior is so odd, and I have clearly spooked them, so I just closed my notepad. Whatever they brought, they believe, was so special and so valuable that they didn't dare allow the media to know about it. Whatever it was, it didn't make the broadcast. After triage, people line up, and they go to selected tables. The real moment of truth for the group. Was that beer mug your dad told you worth, an ant worth something? No. Was your the story your mom told you about the silk purse with the gold edges true? Yes, it was worth $15,000. A tall, thin man in pink pants wearing a giant Hermes belt buckle presented a small lacquered box. The appraiser told him there seemed to be a condition issue with the lacquer, and they thought the amber was some sort of composite. After that, he said a polite thank you, left the table and said, damn it, under his breath. <laughs> Another appraiser was doing his best to be as professional as possible as someone presented him with a nutcracker, which should have been called a buttcracker because the crushing part of the figurator was not the jaws. 
a nice family from Connecticut had hoped a painting they found at the print shop was something special. Another lady said that her grandmother's grilled cheese maker was valued at cool, and she was okay with that. It's this thing that Richard Thaler called the endowment effect. You believe that whatever you have is worth more. And the way the science backs him up is that the neuroscience suggests that it's actually not that you love the thing, you have an aversion to the loss of the thing. Disco uh, Yale University researchers discovered that there are two areas of the brain that register anxiety and even pain when they are stimulated when certain people are asked to discard a personal item. And in this study, the item was a piece of junk mail. It's hard to discard something if you think it has emotions. Anthropomorphizing is a big issue for people who can't get rid of junk. And there's one big contributor to junkaholism that is prevalent and really hard to avoid, touching leading to ownership. The science supports the reason why retailers always want to get something in your hands. A purchase is more likely to be made if someone holds the item. Two researchers, one at the University of Wisconsin in Madison and the other at UCLA, noticed the Attorney General of Illinois had sent out a warning to shoppers about what they called haptic manipulation, meaning being pressured to handle items during the holiday season. So they decided to do a study of it. They had 231 people in all. Some were presented with a slinky and a mug on a table about two feet away. The others, same setup, but they were asked to touch and play with the slinky and check out the mug. Um, at the end of it, the people who touched the items had grown indifferent. They asked to take them home. People who hadn't got up and left. It's also the length of time that you touch an object can affect how you feel about it. A project called The Power of Touch revealed participants who held mugs longer were willing to pay 60% more than participants who held the mugs for shorter periods of time. I watched all of this actually happen in real time because I had to go out and find junk to do this. This was all the science. This was kind of the easy part. You call professors, you go to, you know, to Yale, you interview people. I was like, how am I going to go find people's junk? People, I can't just go knock on people's doors. So I did two things. One, I went to something called the 411 yard sale. It is a 250 mile long yard sale that goes from Alabama through Georgia and finishes in Tennessee. So drove the whole way up, pulled over. People just go to the side of the road with their crap and sell it. Um, some of the people are antiques dealers, some of the people, it's like beheaded Barbies. It's the most surreal experience I've ever seen. And along the way, I would ask people, well, what's your definition, you know, I kind of sidle up to them after looking at their stuff, what's your definition of junk? And this B Betty Jo, I'll never forget her, she was big, loud, and hilarious from Leeds, Alabama. She said, stuff is something someone else might want, but junk has gots to go. Um, and it was something she said gots to go because Professional organizers talk about letting go of stuff all the time, and it's a very specific language. Uh, and of the professional organizers I interview, they talk about letting go because peep, it's not the thing a lot of the time, it's the memory associated to the thing. And you have to get to the point where you have to get people to understand it's not the thing, it actually is the memory. So where is junk? It's in, it's, it's in developed countries. The National Association of Professional Organizers, at their 25th anniversary, there were Almost half of the G20 was represented. There were attendees from Australia, Brazil, Mexico, Canada, Germany, Guatemala, Israel, Japan, any place with easy access to inexpensive goods. On the other hand, Cuba, there's no junk in Cuba. Years of embargoes have created an island of fixers and upcyclers. I'd gone to Havana and my host cooked the most amazing meal on a barbecue he made out of a wrought iron chair, some wire with some charcoal in it, and it was like kind of his version of a Weber grill and it was great. And I think it will be very interesting as Cuba opens up to see what happens. I think somebody should get a grant and study that. A lot of this junk culture started in the 1980s. It was the area of big hair, big appetites. Greed was good, as we all heard in the movie. And if you look up greed, actually one of the definitions of greed is acquisitiveness, which means seeking of possessions. McMansion started in the 80s. In the 1980s, home sizes they leveled off a little bit, but in 1950, the average home size was 983 square feet. In 2014, 2,690 square feet. George Carlin saw it coming. His routine was, your house is a place to keep all your stuff. His house is a pile of stuff with a cover on it. That's what your house is, a place to keep your stuff while you go out and get more stuff. The ability to accumulate in the 80s became easier than ever. It was the arrival of the superstore, Costco, Price Club, 1980s, QVC, HSN started. You didn't even have to leave your house. In the 1980s, the National Association of Professional Organizers started. In the 1980s, the container store started. In the 1990, pods started. That's where they bring those giant 
containers to your house on something called Podzilla, and they can drop it in, in your lawn. In the early 90s, Podzilla, it's when it started. By 2015, it was worth a billion dollars. The 1980s was when it started. It started to thrive. It became something that became monetized. And it's really about generations clashing. It was this moment. You had Depression-era folks with one expert called the veteran generation who were told to save, save, save. Their children, the baby boomers, came of age when the culture, the imperative was to buy, buy, buy. And when buying made more economic sense than fixing as they got older, now their children's millennials carry everything on their phones, at least seek out micro-living, shared cars and workspaces, and they don't want anything that their parents have accumulated. So that's why we are sort of drowning in junk. So who are you going to call? You're going to call junk busters. The next part of where I found junk was I went across the country with five different junk removal companies in five different cities. I went to Austin, Texas with the junk busters, and it was really interesting to see what people called junk. They literally pulled a piano out of a 5,000 square house because the people were moving into a 6,000 square foot house. No one longer needed that junky piano, which he then took to a church, by the way. Uh, I went to Akron, Ohio. The name of the company there was Trash Daddy. It was run by a Christian conservative farm boy turned entrepreneurs. His guys happened to carry tasers because they do a lot of eviction cleanouts. In Asheville, North Carolina, it was the junk recyclers. They'd take things back, upcycle them, and sell them in a giant warehouse because there's all that really good old furniture in North Carolina. In Portland, Oregon, I found a woman junk removal company, Annie Hall. Great name. Uh, she's a former landscaper who saw an opportunity. Uh, and that was the one place, I saw, only, only house I saw a gun in. <laughs> Um, and in Chicago, I rode along with Junk Vets, who was founded by a former Marine. He's a first-generation Mexican-American who saw this business as living the American dream. He treated me to my first hoarder house. Uh, and he was just such a good guy. He was really understood that he was meeting people at some of their hardest and most difficult times. Um, and he has since been contacted by a television company to make a TV show about him. Um, He's, it's, these guys I got like superheroes. They really come in at a time when people just can't cope anymore. And I have to say, when those guys came to my house, they were the superheroes. Okay, got ten more, about five more minutes and I'll take some questions. So, you know, obviously I went up and I looked at the original meaning of the word junk. And it's actually kind of interesting. It was originally old rope found on boats. And the sailors would make a distinction between good junk and bad junk. Good junk could be repurposed. Bad junk could be dangerous because it could make a cable giveaway. It could mean life or death. And that's something that it, I get into the book a little bit about sort of the nature of bad junk, whether that's junk food, junk bonds, junk science. Junk science is a really huge issue. Uh, there's a scholar, a man I interviewed, a journalist named John Bohannon, and he exposed the recently the amount of junk science out there being unchecked. In 2013, over a period of 10 months, he submitted this incredibly flawed article to journals, to open online source journals. These are the ones that don't require peer review. When I asked him how warped the paper was, he laughed, sadly, and said, that paper was so bad. You want to talk about junk science, the paper was trash. The data didn't support the conclusion. I didn't use the right controls at all. It shouldn't take more than five minutes to know this paper is bad. He used a fake name. He passed himself off as a scientist named Okufaro Albengi from the Wasu Institute of Medicine in Asmara. Asmara exists, this is the capital of Eritrea, but the Wasi Institute does not. Of the 304 open source journals that received the paper, 157 published it. He was sent on to tell me it was really depressing. We all want to trust science because science itself is based on trust. That's how this whole thing works. We trust each other. If I do an experiment, you shouldn't have to wonder if I did the experiment, if my analysis and data holds up. The problem with junk science and junk journals is that publishing that it is polluting the pool of knowledge. So when I was thinking about all this good junk and this bad junk, it led me to think also about like, that can apply to your life. That can apply to whatever business that you're in. What's floating around that's masquerading as something useful to you and it's really more like that piece of that bad rope? What do you have in your life that is getting in the way of making good pathways, making them bad pathways? How can you clean it up? You know, in my business, for example, there's 
good journalism and there's junk journalism. One professional organizer described physical junk this way, but it applies to mental clutter as well. Clutter is anything you don't need, use, or love. It's anything that gets in the way of your success. It's the excuses that hold you back from taking action. The brain spaghetti that leaves you feeling overwhelmed. Decisions left unmade, tasks left unfinished, crowded environments, all causing slow to no progress. So the truth is we can't really make all of this stuff disappear. We're kind of a little bit um, outrun by all the companies. But what you can do is think about your relationship to junk. You can manage your junk. This is what we need to do as individuals. It was interesting because I talked to Dr. David Tone, who's a really well-known researcher at Yale, and he was giving me all of his nice pat answers about junk and all the things he talks about. And, and then I said something just sort of like, what about like just being mindful, you know? And he got all excited and he lit up and he said, you know, we're really looking at that in terms of people who have issues with junk. And I'll read this last quote to you. He said, maybe what makes some sense would be for you people to be mindful of it. Recognize that you're having these thoughts and these feelings and sort of make a decision about, well, what do I want to do in the moment? Not just what does this thought in my head want me to do or what does this emotion want me to do? And I, we sometimes refer to it as being your own boss. You know, can I be my own boss rather than letting my thoughts and feelings be the boss here? So, and then, you need to be a boss of your junk. I'm happy to take any questions about the book, about the show, about anything else. If you just want to tell me about your junk, that happens a lot at these, I have to tell you. <laughs> I've been to these when there have been like four people, and it's been like a little group therapy session, there's been like 200 people, and everyone's talking about their junk, so feel free. I, I, I read that it's, it's almost impossible now to even um, to monetize or even get rid of um, furniture, particularly wooden furniture yes. that are hand-me-downs because millennials don't want them, goodwill turns it away, they can't yeah. monetize it. It's like, where's it going? Yeah, the guys in Asheville, North Carolina really found that because they had, you know, North Carolina has all those old furniture companies and their setup was awesome. They were kind of on the wrong side of town, but they had this giant warehouse and they'd bring it back and they had artists come in and reimagine the furniture and then they could have a booth and they could sell it. And as one of the guys said, you know, I'd like a kid just starting out to have a beautiful piece of old wood furniture rather than some cardboard from Ikea. And what we're doing here with this is allowing people to have something really beautiful. So I think upcycling is kind of where that, I mean, in a perfect world, uh, but they had a really good business model going. It was interesting. Hi. Did you ever clean out your parents' basement? Is it, is it still it's sold. It goes on a, someone else owns it. It's someone else's problem now. But it took so long. And it was, I mean, I can't even tell. My, my mother was so clean. Her kitchen was white. Her couches were white. Her rugs were white. She was like perfectly, she looked like Lena Horne. She was perfectly put together. They just, that sense of like not being able to give anything away or that it might, you know, the scarcity of it. But it took almost a year. It took almost a year and several, the college hunk guys, we, were, had, we had a relationship going. <laughs> John and I were, we were like this by the end. Anybody else? Somebody wants to tell me about their junk. I know you do. Well, you know, I'm happy to sign books, and Liz is here from WNC, and we have special gifts for everybody who showed up because, like I said, I really appreciate you guys coming out on this dreary, dreary night. So Liz brought, do you, ha you have them? Can we give them out? Yeah. So I talked them into the, all of it, talk, so I talked them into giving me my own um, giveaway for the pledge drive. This is the... Come on, <laughs> you can put all of it. I think we've got enough for everybody, yeah? You don't have to take it. If it's crap to you, if it's junk, you don't have to take it, I'm telling you. But I think they're pretty cool. I, are you guys all, are you WMIC listeners? Are you WMIC? Yeah. 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 You are? Okay, good. Who are my listeners? <laughs> yeah. My most difficult thing to get rid of is books. Books, <laughs> books are so hard. Talking about not oh, books. Books. Yeah. So books are like, they've been sold for like 10 cents a pound. Or something. It's yeah. like, it's like really crazy. It is crazy. Getting rid of stuff is so hard to do. It really is. I mean, that's one thing I, 
which I saw with most of these, most of these junk, <laughs> most of the junk uh, removal. Yeah, you can leave it a lot of there too. I mean, yeah. I, I <laughs> Most of these junk removal companies, most of them are really green, and they will figure out. I, I just I, that was one thing I did. I said I didn't want to do. I didn't want to highlight any company that wasn't truly recycling. You'll notice there's not a really a big chain involved with one of the companies. I, I researched that. I did not want to have places where I knew they were dumping. Hmm? So you have some in the book, is it? Yeah, these five different junk removal companies. In in New York, the people I found who are the best um, are the junk lovers. Mm -hmm. They really, they're very, they care very much. They take a lot of time to make sure that everything gets donated, um, or at least they try to keep as much out of landfills as possible. So if you need help, I'm not getting paid. I would just say it's the junk luggers. Well, you guys, again, I said thank you so much for coming out. It's, it's, like, it's a tough night, and um, I really appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah.